Hi, everybody. I'm Jimmy Burse, and welcome back to the Build a Better Nonprofit podcast. I'm excited today because I've got my friend Mary Wheatley, who's the CEO at the National Scleroderma Foundation. Hey, Mary, great to have you on the show today. Welcome. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, you have worked in the rheumatology space now for uh, quite a long time before scleroderma. It was the Rheumatology Research Foundation, right? That's right. And the American College of Rheumatology. So the Rheumatology Research Foundation is the 501c3 foundation of the American College of Rheumatology, which is a 501c6 association. But I was with them for about 15 years. That's that's terrific. And scleroderma is a rheum rheumatology type of? It, it is. It rheum is. So it falls under the broad spectrum of rheumatic disease. And so if, for anybody who's, who's watching or listening, uh, right before we hit record, you were thanking me for knowing what scleroderma was. But for those who don't, want to just give us a, a minute on what that is and why we should care about it if we're listening? Absolutely. So scleroderma is a rare autoimmune disease that affects the tissue in the body. And it can affect anyone at any age. And the cause is still unknown. And there is no cure. So it affects about 300,000 people in the U.S. So it is a rare disease. There are different types of scleroderma. So that's all the types combined make up about 300,000 cases here in the U.S. So we definitely do a lot to try to increase awareness. And Jamie, I was sharing before we started that I was so grateful that you knew what it was because you've had some experience in the, in the Boston area working with people affected by the disease years ago. And that's actually where our office is headquartered is on the North Shore of Boston. So a small world, but anything we can do to raise awareness definitely helps with lots of things that we do as an organization, but primarily getting uh, earlier diagnosis. So if people know about the signs and symptoms, they can get to the right specialist and it can really prevent a lot of irreparable harm. That's right. Uh, yeah, the, the, the folks who I came across in Boston years ago, I still think back to them and, and how they made me feel. And it was part of what really galvanized me toward working in the, the nonprofit uh, healthcare space. So thank you for all what you do and all what your, your team does. Now, with working in the rheumatology space for 20 years now, see if I can find the right way to ask this question. How does it feel you're, you're not just the leader of an organization by being involved in, in a cause like this for so long, but you're really one of the leaders of a whole community around rheumatology and the, the ailments that afflict patients and their families. Well, it's very kind of you to say. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was making my next move was how could I take everything that I've learned? And I've had such wonderful mentors and teachers um, in the rheumatology space over the years. But drawing a line back even further to that, to my days in research at UAB, thinking, you know, what is the common thread here? And, and so as I think about my next step, how can I keep that line kind of going? And I realized it was all in this chronic disease space. So started out working with chronic stroke patients at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, which is also my alma mater, go Blazers, and, and then moved on to working with problem drinkers in the School of Public Health. And then made the leap to the the nonprofit side, uh, where I always would tease, I get to give money away now <laughs> instead of like yeah. writing grants and asking, you know, for NIH funding and that kind of thing. Got to make people's day by saying, "Great, you got a grant." And then, you know, moving into the executive director role, of course, then I was asking for money, so <laughs> shift a little bit. And now, as CEO, certainly doing that, but being able to draw that line and realize what was compelling to me about all of those different roles was that in the chronic disease space, people are living with this, these diseases for their entire lifetime. And so in that, um, there's a lot of disease management aspect to that, but there's also the relationships they're building with their care teams. And that was what I found so special about rheumatology was the rheumatology care teams, whether it was uh, rheumatologists or nurses or physical therapists that were involved in the care of people living with these diseases were so invested in their well-being over a lifetime. And so they developed these lifelong relationships and it was just such a special place. Um, and I feel so fortunate to still be a part of it. And our community is just so incredible and so resilient and really just working together to, to make everyone's lives better. When you were growing up, what, what did you want to be and how, how close, uh, <laughs> how, how close is it that, um, to what you're doing now or, 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 um, yeah, 
it's funny you should ask. I wanted to be a doctor mm-hmm. and um, actually started out as pre-med at UAB. And I hope this isn't too gross, but we they actually are one of the only schools to do cadaver lab for freshmen. And I very quickly realized, Jamie, it was not for me. And if I, if I cut my finger, I've been known to maybe pass out just a little bit. So um, I didn't know that about myself at the time. So I, I'm grateful that I was am able to still be involved in the healthcare space in a way where it's like I can add value and, and give back. But very quickly became aware that I was uh, not cut out for that line of work. I had great admiration for people who can who can do that. But it, so it is kind of funny to think, you know, that was what I wanted to do. And then I am kind of tangentially involved in this way. So, yeah, be able to shift and and, um, and take advantage of uh, the strengths that you do have to be able to do it. And I caught that too, pun involved, I, I pun intended with the um, not cut out. <laughs> it wasn't, but I'll take it. I love a good pun. So when we, we actually met up last week at a, a shared conference that both of us were at, you were talking about um, merging up together some of the affiliates that are uh, doing amazing work around the country uh, for scleroderma and the patients and families who are affected by it, and really uniting those different affiliates and communities all around the country into one cohesive national community. Obviously, there's some challenges that come with that, but What's, what's been your secret? Because, because obviously we're, we're to have people watch this and hear it who are doing almost the same kind of, kind of thing of being able to bring in affiliates or go through um, a merger with another like-minded organization. What's been your secret to uh, unite, that, unite your community? Yeah, it's been, um, gosh, it's been years in the making. And when I came into this role, it was something that the leadership of the organization was really transparent about, that they were in the middle of this work and were really looking to me to, to kind of take it over the finish line in partnership, of course, with all of these chapters that we work with. And, and I can't take credit for any of it. I think all I've done is really facilitate the process. It's really the vision of the leadership at each of the chapters and at the national level recognizing the benefit of being a part of something bigger, right? Of we're all in it together. We're all working toward the same shared mission. And I think as we were doing that, we were also working on our brand and our identity and who we are as an organization. And I think that really helped crystallize why we do what we do and the communities that we serve and how we serve them. And that we can't do that without chapters. You know, the way we are built is that we deliver locally and regionally, and we want to be where the people are. We want to make sure that everyone can have access to what we do, and that's through our chapters. And so we had to, you know, bring everyone in and then take a look at where our gaps were. And so that's where we are now in terms of rolling out this chapter structure to make sure that no matter where someone is in the country or in their diagnostic journey, they can have access to what we're providing free of charge. And it's, you know, it's, I'm oversimplifying it. It was a huge amount of work for everyone involved because 25 years ago when the foundation was formed, it was actually formed out of a merger mm-hmm. of two organizations. And, and one of those organizations was a federated uh, chapter model where all of the chapters were independent 501c3s. And so there was this legacy model that was kind of baked in for more than 20 years before this was addressed that, you know, there was probably a simpler governance structure oh. <laughs> that we could that we could look at. But, you know, you can say something simple, but then, you know, getting into it and operationalizing it and um, just the identities and, and you know, people's lives tied up in this that have been doing this for 20 plus years was something we had to give just a lot of credence and credit to and respect to, you know, especially me coming in brand new and saying, well, this makes sense on paper. You know, there are so many people who have been involved for much, much longer than I have and predate this organization who, who you know, were tied up in this in, in very meaningful ways. And like I said, there there. There be, there'll be organizations out there that are looking to bring in um, uh, affiliates and be able to unite it all under one banner or ones that uh, may go through a, through a, a merger, which is, you know, I would say that there, there's a lot of overlap on the kinds of things that uh, you need to think about and go through. But what's something through your experience or through others who you've talked to that's been part of this process of uniting all of these affiliates what, what's something that uh, you've learned that you want to pass along to an organization that might just be entering the process now or thinking about entering the process? Well, first of all, I was fortunate to have uh, get advice from people who have 
gone before and done this with other organizations. Sure. And their CEOs were so kind to talk to me and share their experience and say, you know, be thoughtful about this. Don't stomp over this part, which I just so appreciated. And I think, you know, I came into it very pragmatically thinking, you know, it makes sense not to have nine audits and nine 990s and nine budgets and nine staff management plans and benefit structures and all of this, like from a, a CEO standpoint. But there was so much more to it from an emotional identity standpoint. And so giving, again, time and space to talk through that. I would also say don't make it harder than it is and just start at the beginning. I was talking to the board chair of one of the chapters coming in and they were very earnestly and, and very vulnerably sharing some concerns. And and I was saying, you know, this is your chapter. This th That doesn't change. This is your chapter. You all come up with the the work plan and the budget and you, you do what you do. It's just done under a different governance structure, under a different operational structure that's actually meant to make your life easier, right? I had led with all of the efficiency and the making your life easier. And it was almost like a sales, you know, pitch. And he said to me, why didn't you just say that in the beginning? Like, it's still our chapter, you know? And I thought, yeah. did I not say that? I didn't say it soon enough or clear enough to say, we're not changing the leadership. We're not choosing the leadership. It's your chapter. That doesn't change. And because I wasn't recognizing the, again, the emotional, the identity, everything that was tied up in that, I was just thinking so much from the business side of things, like, why why wouldn't you do this? This makes so much sense. So I think that has been a huge lesson for me. So lead into the Renee Zellweger, uh, Tom Cruise kind of thing of um, you, you, you had me at this chapter is still mine. Yes. Make make sure you're getting that out of the, the chapter affiliates. Okay. Yeah. I was leaning right. too much on the help me help you. <laughs> not on the, uh, not on the, you know, you had me at this. It's still yours. This is still your baby, you know? Uh, perfect. I just, um, oftentimes it's shared with me and I felt this way, uh, plenty of times too, that the CEO role or the CEO seat can feel lonely at times mm -hmm. where you're accountable to the board and also accountable to your staff at the same time where, you, you know, you don't always get a, a, a sounding board sometimes on trying to, uh, suss out what the best decision is to make or. Uh, how long to sit back on something or how, how, how quickly, you know, sort of to pounce on an opportunity. How do you sort of strike that, that, that balance? So you don't feel so lonely and sort of balancing out that accountability to both the board and the staff. Yeah, I think earlier in my career, I drew a much finer line in terms of, you know, personal life, professional life and work-life balance. And now I say, oh, I hate that term work-life balance. It's all life, right? Like, Work is part of your life and your family is part of your life and you definitely need balance, but it's not a fine line. Like you have to show up authentically as yourself wherever you are. And it took me a, probably longer than most to get there, but uh, that's how I approach it now. And certainly, you know, there are things you can't share, uh, you know, with your staff team or, or your direct reports and that kind of thing. But I have found that showing up that way and being vulnerable and earnest with my leadership and forming a really tight relationship with my board chair, you know, as me, not as some persona of what I think a CEO should look like has helped me so much because then, you know, when there are times and there are always times in our nonprofit worlds where we have to have really hard discussions or be really transparent about something that's going on that's very sensitive, that they know me well enough to know, like, if I'm bringing this up, it's a it's a big issue, right? And we've got to do something about it pretty quickly. And the same with my leadership team. There are things I certainly, I think, guard and protect them from. And I, you know, I want to be, I share as much as I can and always say, you know, the old CAE acronym of LERP, if it's legal, ethical, reasonable, and practical, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to overshare probably um, information. But there are certain things from a legal, ethical practical standpoint that I, I can't share with you. And I'm going to share as, as much as I can, as often as I can, but, but it does kind of put up a little bit of a barrier, right? With that, uh, with those relationships, because you do have to have those boundaries of like, there is a lot on our shoulders in terms of all of the, the legal, ethical, all of those things mm -hmm. that we have to keep and we have to seek counsel on those things and, you know, make informed decisions about those things, but it can't always be from that, that group of people, right? And and for good reason, but it does it can make it very lonely. And especially when you're hearing like, you know, complaints from the team about something and, you know, like, 
you know, if you only knew this one thing, you wouldn't <laughs> kind of right. be complaining about that. Or if I, if you had any idea that we're working on this, but there's this huge barrier because of a new legislation or a new, you know, tax thing, like, but you just, you can't go there. You don't want to um, worry people needlessly until you have a solution in place. And so that definitely learned to just be as transparent of like, you know, we're working on a solution or, you know, as transparent as I can without, you know, just freaking people out. Um, because again, it's like, one of my former colleagues used to call it beautiful minds. Like, you don't, if you let people into the <laughs> beautiful mind that's going on behind the scenes, it just, um, it's kind of chaotic, right? And, and scary. So I think it's for the protection of those people and not in a, not in a patronizing way. They're certainly capable of dealing with big things and do every day in their jobs. But these things obviously have larger implications in those, in those areas that I mentioned. Yeah, I understand. It's like um, if somebody leaves an organization, for example, and obviously we're, we're not going to ever talk about that to other colleagues, but some of them would say, oh, well, what's the deal with, with Mark? Like, I thought he was fantastic. And you're like, well, if you only knew this like one thing that you're not seeing, and I can't tell you because as you said, you sat around, um, right. you know, LARP. Yeah. And it's, it's, just, it's, 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 it's tough. Uh, cause you do have to deal with that for a period of time of, uh, well, what, why did that happen? And if, if he went, then am I next or. Right. Yeah. You're so, yeah. It, it creates so much angst and staff turnover is definitely an issue. And I think more so now, right. Than it used to be. I think at least we've found in our organization and, um, my kind of message to the team is always, you know, if it were you, you wouldn't want us talking about your particular instance. And I can't tell you, well. Joe went to a for-profit company and he's making twice what he was. <laughs> I can't ask him to stay and work more and make less, you know, or Joe's been on a pit for a good six months or, you know, like you, you can't tell those details, but you want people to think the best of their colleague, whether they're with us or not. And there's just always so much nuance to those situations, unless it's the best case scenario where someone has shared with you, I'd really love to be working for Jamie at Zero Prostate and you say, great, let's help you get there. And then you can share transparently, you know, Joe's going to work at Zero Prostate with Jamie and we're so excited for him. And this is, you know, this is how the transition's going to look. And that does happen, right? But I feel like less and less is it that scenario. It's more and more kind of the latter, unfortunately. And, um, you know, people are, are jumping to where they need to be. And, and we just have to show grace in, in that moment to them and, and to the team too. So uh, what I hear you saying is that the secret and the balance between staying accountable to the board and staying accountable to your staff to your staff is is uh, bridge building with um, with really your whole self and being able to open up and be as vulnerable as you can be to to build meaningful and trusting relationships. Absolutely, and sharing as much information again as possible without crossing those lines of the legal or ethical. Yeah. And so for those who are watching or listening, uh, I'll put you on the spot here. What's what's something that you've shared with your board and your team that's been, you know, to open yourself up a little bit and be um, mm -hmm. vulnerable that's kind of created that that bridge? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I feel like it's now I do it so, so much. I think it's kind of second nature. But one example is pointing to my style as an example. So we have done a lot of work on culture and being very intentional on the culture that we're designing and that we want for ourselves and tracking our success on delivering on that culture and the commitments we make to one another in that. And that's not just our staff team, that's across our organization. So we started with our staff team and, mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of took it out on the road and said, does this resonate? Does this make sense? And it doesn't for everyone. I mean, that's just where we are. And so as i having these discussions with the team about, you know, this is where we're falling down on just on a pulse survey or something, you know, not, it's not my opinion. It's what I'm seeing. Here are some examples. We're not making it as easy as we could be to volunteer for this organization. So what, what can we do to make that better? And rather than say, I've seen Joe, I'm so glad I don't have a Joe on my team because I'm really giving it to this guy today. Um, <laughs> you know, I've more, seen Joe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen Joe do X, Y, Z, and that is just not how we operate because I'm not going to call someone out or even like vaguely allude to something I've seen. I'm going to point back to myself and say, you know, well, I've learned about myself over the years that I'm quick to place blame and and say things like, you know, well, it's not my fault if a board member didn't read the board book, you know, <laughs> well, it is. 
it is my fault if a board member didn't read the board book because maybe it's 300 pages long. And while it may be beautifully tabbed out, Jamie, in a PDF with bookmarks and hyperlinks and all this, if I'm not making it accessible or easy and thinking about people's different learning styles and their busy schedules, this is not their day job. That is on me. That's my job to make sure that people are digesting the information I'm providing them ahead of a meeting where I'm asking them to use that information to make a decision. And so I'll kind of point to that and not in a like self-detrimental way, but in a like, this is something I've learned about myself that I've had to work on. And so um, are we seeing any of that happen in our community? You know, we're rolling out all of these trainings. Are they all webinars? Are we sending 50 page, you know, uh, manuals after them, you know, and mm -hmm. are we thinking about learning styles? Are we being multimodal, multi-channel? Truly? Are we only engaging people who are tech savvy? What about people who want to do it over the phone that we're going to need to sit down with? If we're truly going to be there in these geographies where we haven't had a presence, we're going to have to be thoughtful about that. And so pointing to my own shortcomings there of like, you know, I had a, a board member who didn't use the computer and had hand involvement and you know, rightfully so. And so I had to call her before every board meeting. And um, I really struggled with that at the beginning. I was like, this is, I've got to remember to do this. And I wouldn't always remember to do it in time. And then I was like, I have to respect that I wanted this person on the board for this reason. And this is an accommodation that they need. And that helps with our diversity and our inclusion and our board. And so this isn't like an inconvenience for me. You know, <laughs> this is some, this is part of what I need to be doing mailing their materials and all of that. And so just thinking through those scenarios, but pointing it back to, to me of like, I've struggled with this. I'm not saying like everyone has to be perfect all the time. We've just got to think through solutions. I love that meeting people where they are, even if it comes down to communication preference on, we all learn best just a little bit differently. You know, some absolutely written, some more audit, auditory. And uh, yeah, and, and I can imagine from having patients on your board that having to type out or, or write can sometimes uh, get painful or just you're not able to do like you used yeah. to do. So I love that. You mentioned culture too and how, how, how that's a, a big part of the organization. What have you done? You as, you as Mary have brought to the culture of the National Scleroderma Foundation. What's the, the most important thing that you've brought for an organizational culture and to National Scleroderma Foundation? I think I think I probably would have said one thing, you know, six months ago, but I think hearing it back from others um, of what has resonated the most, I think is transparency. So making sure that we're regularly reaching out and reporting on our progress on our strategic initiatives and on our financial position and our financial health publicly. I mean, we're doing that. Anyone can join our quarterly stakeholder calls and that's what I've gotten the most positive feedback on of like, you know, this is super transparent and you're putting it out there and sharing and um, and we appreciate that. And I would have said before, I think that it was care or, you know, making sure that we're demonstrating care um, for one another, for everyone in our community. I love the phrase uh, customer obsessed, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I want us to be community obsessed and really thinking about how every decision we make impacts the people in our community. But I think what I've heard back is that it's that transparency of just sharing information on a regular basis with everyone. Yeah, it um, makes everybody feel like they're uh, closer together and in the know and can, you know, mm -hmm. almost be able to share their opinions or, or, or weigh in in order to be able to buy in on the direction of the organization. Tell me, what what advice would you have for someone who is uh, aspiring to, to reach for more in their nonprofit career? Oh, gosh. Um, you have such great questions. Um, or something that you know maybe, now that you wish you knew then, maybe. Oh, I think that that one comes to me much easier of, you know, I wish I knew it was okay to ask for help and advice. Um, I definitely tried to do it all on my own in the beginning, you know, years ago. And, and I think that is a little bit of my personality, too, like very type A, very like, <laughs> I don't need anyone. I can do it myself. Oldest child all the way. But finally, you know, realizing, again, being in a lot of leadership coursework and peer circles and things like that, realizing like, gosh, you know, the most I get out of these, even ASAE annual meeting or my GSAE state society meetings, I would always come away with like, I learned so much more from like my peers in those meetings than I did from like the flashy keynote speaker, you know, 
And so I think it took that for me to realize, like, I need to be calling on these people and like creating that network of um, of wisdom and, and being able to ask for advice and ask for help. And especially I'm glad I learned it before I came into this position because I had never worked with chapters before directly. Um, you know, I had worked alongside organizations that had chapters and definitely knew that they were going through similar changes that we had proposed. And so I was able to then call them and say, you know, tell me, what did you do? How did you do this? Like, what what do you wish you knew? And that was a game changer for sure. Well, I guess what I would add to that is you don't need to know everything, which is uh, when, when I started in, in the position, yeah. not to the point of being on uh, an executive team of feeling like I, I needed to have all the answers for everybody. But yeah, I, yeah. I had them in my head of like, oh, if I'm the, you know, chief strategy officer or CEO, then I should have all the answers for everybody. They're going to be looking to me for all the answers and learn pretty quickly that that that's just not the way it, it goes. It, it's, it's more along the lines of, you know, bringing the subject uh, matter experts into the, into the room and trusting what they have to say. So I resonated with what you were, what you were talking about. And that's, that's what it made me think of, of one of the things that I wish that I learned sooner. Yeah, that's a huge one. I can definitely relate to that as, as well of, uh, wanting to be like the expert of, of everything, but realizing like, well, my expert is like facilitation and strategy and, you know, management. And so it's not scleroderma, it's not <laughs> rheumatic disease, you know, I, I know, enough to know what, how we can serve our community, but not from a medical perspective. And so we have to have medical experts come in for that. And and I don't know what it's like to live with this disease every day. So we have to have, you know, patient experts come in and, and share with us about that. It's, it's, that's huge. Yeah, it definitely a good blend, blend of that expertise around you and being able to I know, either be the maestro or the quarterback to sort of, um, you know, point to, to, to different people to try to get uh, what's needed in order to be able to move the organization forward. That's key. What, um, what's one thing that other nonprofit leaders out there can identify with that's keeping you up at nightly? Um, well, you mentioned staff turnover that hasn't been huge. We have a relatively small team, about 30 people, but it's been enough that I feel like our wheels are turning uh, a little bit. We're always recruiting. It feels like, um, mm -hmm. for one or two positions, so that's one. It feels like we kind of can't catch our breath. I remember, I think it was this time last year. I was like, we're fully staffed. <laughs> that lasted for like four months. <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, that's the nature of the beast. And that, that's true anywhere. But I do feel like in the last three years, the volatility in um, the market has definitely impacted nonprofits in that there's so much more competition because of remote work. For us, it's been great for recruitment because we can recruit really great people from anywhere. Um, so we've definitely benefited from it. But then there is more competition, um, of course, for for really great people. And so that definitely keeps us up at night and, and me up at night. I think um, the other is really the impact of you know external factors, like the impact of the economy on individuals. We're seeing that this year. And, you know, the the data we're seeing is that it's down about 30 percent. That tracked true for us in the first half of the year. It's, it's come up a little bit um, here in the second half. Our fiscal, sorry, is July through June. But that's one of those things, you know, what can you really you're pulling all the levers, you're doing all the right things, you're uh, you're doing more than you've ever done before. But there are these external factors that you can't do much about. And so just trying to think of like strategies to combat that and that, that definitely keeps you up at night. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I, I hear that uh, repeated over and over and over and over again, both retention of staff and being able to have uh, individual uh, and donors engaged in a way that you know maybe they were a few years ago, uh, pre-pandemic, or being able to, uh, to, to discover you know the new ways that that uh, that that donors and and fundraisers sort of behave. Which I think is a bit different these days. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, we'll have a study on this, right? In like two years and we'll all be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But in the moment, it's so, it's so painful trying to kind of uh, just understand what, what can we be doing better and how can we better be supporting and communicating with our donor base? And what's the, what's the, the secret to re, to retention? Um, how do you, how do you sort of uh, battle that and get to the, get back to the point of, Hey, holy staff now. 
Oh, gosh, I wish I knew that answer. One of the things we've found in terms of recruitment and being able to recruit nationally um, is that when we are talking to people who have a personal connection, like they personally care about the cause, they've spent time in, you know, in a nonprofit space that touches scleroderma, whether it's, you know, rheumatology or rare disease or some kind of connective tissue disease, we're seeing, I think, higher retention with those folks. Like they, they're invested in the mission, they're invested in the cause, they want to be a part of the organization and what we're doing. And there's, there's higher retention there. I think when we're plugging in, you know, someone with a specific skill set or something like that, um, there's just a higher risk, I think, is what we're seeing um, without that connection. And you're just not always going to have that. I mean, that's, that's golden. <laughs> Everyone cares, right? Everyone's in it for the right reasons. But to have that kind of background and, and come into it and really be able to, from day one, understand, you know, the, the scope of what we're doing. Sure. Mary Wheatley, CEO of the National Scleroderma Foundation. Mary, thanks for being on the show. I appreciate you. Thanks for making time and sharing your wisdom and insights into your leadership and everything that's going on in the scleroderma space and being able to manage affiliates and unite people across the country. Fantastic. Thanks for coming on the show today. Oh, Jamie, it was such a pleasure. Thank you again for having me on. Right. Thank you.